Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to this edition of PG Online Classes, organized by ISAV. It is my pleasure and honor to invite our esteemed speaker, Dr. Chandran. During this lecture, I request you all to mute yourself while the lecture is going on. You can post your queries in the chat box, and these will be taken up by the faculty at the end of the session. The presentation will be streaming live on YouTube, and it will uh, the recording will be available on our website after this. Today's session is on ophthalmic anesthesia. The ophthalmic surgeries are one of the most common procedures performed, but they have a myriad of patients from children coming for squint surgeries to cataract surgeries in elderly patients. The goals are pain-free surgical procedures, rapid recovery, and minimization of risk associated with surgery and anesthesia. Our esteemed speaker today is Dr. Jay Chandran V. He is a deputy director at the Department of Anesthesiology and chairperson for Hospital Safety Committee, Shankar Netrale, Chennai. He is the founder and secretary for Association of Indian Ophthalmic Anesthesiologists. He is also currently the international president for the World Congress of Ophthalmology, 2020 to 24. He's a certified professional in patient safety by Institute of Health and Improvement, IHI Boston. He's also the president of the International Association of Healthcare Data Analytical, IAHDA. Along with the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT, he has developed simulators for practicing regional ophthalmic blocks. First of its kind, called as Ophthalmic Anesthesia Simulation System, OSS, and real-time view mannequin for needle blocks and also subtenance block stimulator. He's also the chief editor for the book titled Principles and Practices of Ophthalmic Anesthesia. He has authored several chapters and has written review articles and published original research papers in national and international peer-reviewed index journals. He was invited nationally and internationally as a guest speaker to conduct the workshop in regional eye block and to perform live demonstration of ophthalmic blocks. His area of interest include regional ophthalmic blocks, pedratic anesthesia, patient safety, and biostatics. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Tiny. madam. Thank you, thank you. So thanks for the nice introduction. So let me share my screen now. Ji, thank you so much, sir. Okay, <clears throat> so it's now seen in the full screen, no? It's now seen in the full screen? Yes, sir. Okay, good evening. So at the outset, I would like to thank the ISA Academic Wing for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk, talk about ophthalmic anesthesia. Dr. Navin actually invited me to cover this topic and he wanted me to cover the whole ophthalmic anesthesia in this one hour. Let me see whether I'm able to cover it or not. Okay. So this is how I thought I will cover the ophthalmic anesthesia. First and foremost, I will be focusing on the regional ophthalmic anesthesia to which we need to know about the anatomy of the orbit and globe and what are the different techniques we follow, what are the complications that occurs following administration of blocks and it's briefly about its management. Then I will move on to general anesthesia. And then I will finally cover the anesthesia that is for various ophthalmology subspecialties. Coming to the anatomy of the orbit pertaining to regional ophthalmic anesthesia, remember the orbit is made up of seven bones mainly. The roof is formed by the frontal overhanging bone. Here you can see. And then the medial wall is formed by the orbital plate of the ethmoid and the lacrimal bone. And the floor is formed by the maxilla and a part of zygoma. And the medial wall is formed by the greater wing of sphenoid and the, and the zygoma. And this is the superior orbital fissure between the two wings of the sphenoid. And this is the inferior orbital fissure between the maxilla and the zygoma. And here we can see the optic foramen. The orbit is an irregular four-sided pyramid. The base is anteriorly placed here and the apex is posterior medially placed. Depth is about 40 to 50 millimeters 
total volume is about 30 cc. And here, this is the superior orbital fissure between the two wings of the sphenoid. This is the optic foramen through which the optic nerve passes. And this is the inferior orbital fissure between the zygoma and the maxilla. Next, the globe anatomy. Horizontally, it is 23.5 millimeter. Anteroposterior is about 24 millimeter. Vertical diameter is around 23. And remember, the volume of the globe occupied in the orbit is about 6 to 6.5 ml. Now, the globe as such is moved by totally six extraocular muscles, mainly four recti muscles and two oblique muscles. And they all originate from a common tendinous fibrinous ring called as annulus of zin. Here we can see here. And they all get inserted just anterior to the equator of the globe, thus forming an incomplete muscle cone-like structure. In between these two muscles, there are septa. And imagine this will be like an incomplete muscle cone. Coming to the nerve supply, the motor nerve supply, the, most of the extraocular muscles are supplied by the third cranial nerve, that is the ocular motor nerve, except you should remember the mnemonics LR6 and SO4, where LR6 stands for the lateral rectus muscle, and this is the sixth cranial nerve, abducens nerve, and superior oblique muscle supplied by the trochlear nerve. So except for these two, rest of the muscles, uh, motor nerve supply is supplied by the third cranial nerve, ocular motor. With regard to the sensory nerve supply, the most of the sclera, ciliary body, iris, cornea, and perilimbal conjunctiva, most of the sensory portions is supplied through the nasociliary nerve, ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Superiorly, as you can see here, it is supplied by the frontal nerve, that is the supraorbital and supratrochlear branches, medially by the infratrochlear nerve, and laterally by the lacrimal nerve and inferiorly by the infraorbital, which is nothing but the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Now, from the anatomy, we will now move on to the techniques of regional anesthesia. It can be divided into two types, akinetic and non-akinetic. With regard to the akinetics, mainly there are two types, needle and subtenance block, also called as cannula blocks. Okay, And the non-akinetics comes the topical anesthesia. So with regard to the needle blocks, there are two types, retrobulbar, which is also called as intraconal, and peribulbar is extraconal. As I was mentioning before, there is an incomplete muscle cone. So in retrobulbar or intraconal, what is happening is that we are penetrating the septa and the needle tip is inside the cone. And here the local anesthetics is deposited, hence it is called as intraconal, retrobulbar. Behind the globe, we are depositing the local anesthetics. Whereas in peribulbar, that is extraconal, which is now mostly followed, here the local anesthetics is deposited outside the muscle cone here. So what will happen in retrobulbar, the local anesthetics are directly placed near the target area, that is the ciliary ganglion. Whereas in the extraconal space, the local anesthetics are deposited outside the muscle cone. Hence the local anesthetics has to traverse from the extraconal space to the intraconal space. That is the reason why they say with retrobulbar there is a quicker onset and lesser volume is required. Whereas with peribulbar, larger volume is required and it takes a little bit longer time to act. Now with regard to the anatomical consideration, I just wanted to keep in mind one important point with regard to the retrobulbar and peribulbar which makes a difference is that as you can see, out, this is the cone. Outside the cone, there are three nerves. That is a lacrimal nerve, frontal, and the trochlear nerve, which was supplying the, which is supplying the superior oblique muscle. So many times, if you are performing the retrobulbar block alone, there are chances for these three nerves to be unblocked. So that is the reason why sometimes what happens if retrobulbar nicely is present, is given, then even then the eye starts to move upwards and inwards. That is due to the action of the superior oblique that is supplied by the trochlear nerve. This point you should remember. Now coming to the traditional retrobulbar block that was followed long back, long back, that is two injections are given. Okay, the first injection is given at the inferolateral quadrant, that is at the junction of the medial two-third and the lateral one-third along the floor of the orbit. Palpate the floor, junction of the two-third and one-third. Percutaneously, we are passing a 23 gauge, 31 millimeter 
needle 10 degrees elevated just from the transverse plane just passing tangential to the globe now once the half of the needle is passed then you should pass the needle upwards and inwards that is behind the globe now the needle tip is placed behind the globe and the needle hub junction reaches the plane of the iris now the injection is performed behind the globe this is the classical traditional retrobulbar block the second block now following the block remember you should give a nice digital massage for 2 minutes then if still echinacea is not achieved then supplementary injection is given at the superomedial quadrant just below the superomedial notch this, this was the traditional retrobulbar block that has been followed okay so what are the advantages and disadvantages as i was mentioning retrobulbar block is naturally since it is deposited near the target area the action is going to be quicker and lesser volume is required therefore what happens less rise in intraocular pressure but since the needle is angulated more medially upwards and inwards there are complications more complications can occur orbital complications and systemic complications which in the future slides i will be covering it up okay then <clears throat> what is happening in the retrobulbar block is that that local anesthetics will not traverse in the upper eyelid area and there are chances for incomplete eyelid echinacea so the globe will be tense but still we can find that eyelid constantly moves so these are all some of the disadvantages and owing to this factors that is orbital complications and systemic complications the retrobulbar block is now not practiced much now this is the point which i want to cover it up here orbital complications minor can be chemosis subconjunctival hemorrhage nothing to worry this these can settle on its own orbital hemorrhage globe damage that is perforation and penetration optic nerve damage that is iatrogenic needle injury to the optic nerve an extra ocular muscle function local anesthetic myotoxicity can occur so one by one we can briefly go through now the orbital hemorrhage can be of two types okay it can be either venous or arterial venous it is hemorrhage is slow in onset so what will happen there will be a markedly blood stained chemosis nothing alarming it it will settle on its own it requires some digital massage that's it whereas arterial hemorrhage there will be a sudden proptosis very tight eyelids okay and there will be a sudden loss of vision retina can be pale and dramatic rise in intraocular pressure can occur requires firm digital pressure and sometimes even iv mannitol is given and diamox and sometimes very rarely surgical intervention emergency basis can be done like paracentesis and lateral cantatomy to avoid the compartmental syndrome and here is an alarming picture of the orbital hemorrhage as you can see the globe is completely tensed okay and the iop will be markedly raised sometimes it is so high that compartmental syndrome can occur and that is the reason why lateral cantotomy is sometimes then it i will be stony heart immediately what you should do you can you should inform the ophthalmologist they will come and see the indirect whether the retina is pale or not then necessary things will be done okay coming to the globe damage you should understand there are two entities one is perforation that is where there is wound of entry and exit will be there penetration where there is will be only a wound of entry there won't be any exit wound okay then what are the signs and symptoms sudden loss of vision hypotonia patient will complain of atypical intense pain and poor or absent red reflex here also again retinal surgeon opinion is sorted out if it is a mild vitreous hemorrhage they do a laser alone if it is moderate vitrectomy might be required if it is dense hemorrhage along with the detachment vitrectomy is carried out with a tamponade is provided by injecting silicon oil now moving on to the systemic complications mainly i want to cover these three local anesthetic systemic toxicity which i think many of the post graduates will be will be known of, especially it is quite common in the non ophthalmic uh, regional part also so mainly i will be covering about the central spread of local anesthetic agent that called that is called as brain stem anesthesia which is very very unique and challenges that is one of the faced by the anesthetist practicing ophthalmic anesthesia then what are the allergic reactions we encounter <coughs> sorry now coming to the central spread of this local anesthetic agents mainly the mechanism they say direct injection of the local anesthetics into the dural cuff around the optic nerve when when the tip of the needle shears the optic nerve sheath what will happen is that as you can see in this picture as we all know the optic nerve is interned 
enclosed by the dural cuff which is now continuous here to the optic chiasma and then it is continuous towards the brain so whenever the needle tip shares the optic nerve sheath and then you are injecting local anesthetics there are chances of the local anesthetic traversing here and reaching the brain stem and one more important point i just wanted to mention it here now remember while blocking the eye should always be in the primary gaze here we can appreciate the eye is in the primary gaze unfortunately the picture is not very clear the tip of the needle is here okay the optic nerve is here whereas atkinson position that is if the eye is turned upwards and inwards that is away from the needle then what will happen the optic nerve is dragged towards the tip of the needle so what will happen the tip of the needle will shear the optic nerve sheath and when you are injecting then brain stem anesthesia can happen and that is the reason why we often always advise the patient strictly to maintain the primary gaze position while the needle is in the intraorbital space now if the needle is if the local anesthetics is accidentally injected in the dural cuff it can either go to the brain stem or the most important thing it can also cross through the optic chiasma to the contralateral eye and this is one of the pathognomonic sign they call contralateral cranial nerve palsy if it is existing then it is a pathognomonic sign for the brain stem anesthesia now the main signs and symptoms are it is highly variable we can't predict at all some patients may present with disorientation drowsiness agitation sweating unresponsiveness cardiovascular and respiratory effects then sometimes the patients may present only with intense shivering because sometimes the local anesthetics will hit the shivering center then sometimes the patient may go in for temporary hemiplegia dysphagia tinnitus difficulty in swallowing it all depends upon the where the local anesthetics goes and targets the brain stem area so depending upon this the patients can have an, any number of variable symptoms and the onset will be typically 10 to 15 minutes following the administration of the local anesthetics pathognomonic sign once again this is a contralateral cranial nerve palsy sign now coming to the allergic reaction it is mainly the ester groups which many of you are aware of it and it is mainly due to the preservative compounds with this also many of the post graduates are aware of but in ophthalmic anesthesia you should remember adjuvants called as hyaluronidase it is a protein enzyme that is added along to the local anesthetics mainly to enhance the spread of the local anesthetics okay now this hyaluronidase it is prepared from the animal protein and there are of late we are coming many cases of contralateral eye swelling here we can see the patient is get got operated in the left eye whereas the right eye you can see the eye swelling that is very very important okay the complete facial puffiness can be there very rarely the patient complains of itching it is very important to detect the signs and symptoms and treat it accurate and treat it properly otherwise what will happen is that you will patients will go in for typical anaphylaxis reaction so one type of test that is performed is intradermal skin test can be performed with hyaluronidase here we can see a nice wheel throughout it is that it is seen here in this picture very clearly it, one of the constant differential diagnosis for this is orbital cellulitis so some of them might be treating with high dose of antibiotics whereas it will simply settle within warfeniramine and sometimes steroids can be needed now coming to the traditional peribulbar block again the first and foremost site that is preferred for the is this infralateral quadrant where the injection is performed at the junction of the medial 2/3 and lateral 1/3 along the floor of the orbit where the most important thing here you should remember here this is the length of the needle it is here 1 inch okay 1 inch needle that is used 23 gauge that is the entry will remains the same as that of in the traditional retrobulbar block only difference is that the needle is passed parallel to the orbital floor and as you can see here there is no angulation done upwards and medially okay so there is no angulation the needle is just past the tangential to the globe until the needle hub junction has reached the plane of iris and the local anesthetics is deposited outside the muscle cone now what are the advantages and disadvantages now the since the needle tip is outside the muscle cone we are not encountering the vital structure so what will happen orbital complications has reduced systemic complication is reduced the other advantage is that since the local anesthetics are deposited outside the muscle cone 
local anesthetic traverses through the upper eyelid space and thereby echinacea of the eyelid also can occur with peribulbar block. But there are some disadvantages, but these are all clinically insignificant. One is the late onset, which I already mentioned in my previous slides. And moreover, since large volume of local anesthetics is required, indirectly it can in turn raise the intraocular pressure. Now, the traditional percutaneous entry I was mentioning was that the junction of the two third and one third, and then injection at the superior medial. But remember, the modern peribulbar block, it says these two sites are no more recommended. Okay, that is very important. The reason is, if you are going to perform the percutaneous injection at the junction of the two third and lateral one third, there is a structure called as inferior rectus muscle. And there are many literature evidences which clearly shows that patients landing up with inferior rectus muscle damage following the traditional point of entry. And moreover, there are vessels supplying the inferior oblique muscle. So patient can land up in diplopia. So this site is no more recommended now. That is the two third and lateral one third. Similarly, the superior medial quadrant supplementary injection that is also the site is no more recommended the reasons are the, that is the quadrant which is the most vascular when compared to all the four quadrants and patients can land up in orbital hemorrhage and this is the least space available when compared to all the four and patients can easily land up in globe damage so both orbital hemorrhage systemic complications as well as globe ophthalmic complications are very common in this superior medial quadrant so what are the safe site that is now being advised now now this is called as modern peribulbar block this is what is now currently recommended in regional ophthalmic anesthesia the first injection is given at the extreme inferior lateral quadrant that is you palpate the floor and then at the lateral wall just above the junction of the floor and the lateral wall you can give the percutaneous injection what are the advantages it is a nice avascular area there won't be any extraocular muscles or vessels least resistance and they say that this space is well connected to the intraconal space also now this should be the first injection that is at the extreme inferior lateral quadrant then what should be the supplementary injection medial peribulbar block which i will be showing a small bit of video and later my slides you will understand it better Medial peribulbar block is given with 26 G half inch needle. Okay, the tuberculin syringe needle, that insulin syringe needle you are seeing here, you can appreciate in this picture. 26 G half inch needle, it is passed perpendicularly in the blind pit between the caruncle and the two canthal angle, and the depth that is passed is 15 to 20 millimeter, and the volume of local anesthetics that can be injected is somewhere around 3 to 10 ml also can be injected. Now, let us see a small video of this regional ophthalmic techniques, which I practice. So, before giving blocks, it is very important to go through the case sheet, examine the patient clinically, explain to the patient in their native language what you are going to do. Intravenous line must be secured, connect the patient to the monitor. This is the needle I use for the performing the peribulbar block, 23G, one inch needle. Palpate the globe before giving blocks. Then make sure there is no abnormal eye movements. The eyes are moving in all the four directions. Here I am palpating the floor as well as the lateral wall. At the extreme inferior lateral corner, I am passing the one inch needle. As you can see, I have not angulated the needle at all. Okay until the needle abjunction has reached the skin. Aspirate it, and most important thing is that you should inject the local anesthetic slowly. As you can see, the patient is not wincing with any pain. Remember, I have not given any sedation at all to this patient. See, he is very much comfortable. So you should inject the local anesthetics very slowly and then give an intermittent digital massage. Make sure the eyelids are closed. Then keep a gauze over it. Then perform. Now you see already almost the echinacea has come, except medial movements are more. So I am performing the medial peribulbar block that is performed to the 26 G half inch needle. This is the caruncle, the two canthal angle. Drop the needle perpendicularly in the blind pit. Okay. And aspirate. Hold the upper eyelid because it is already blocked now. 
will perform the medial peripheral bar injection. Again, intermittent digital massage is performed. Once again, I'm checking the efficacy of the block. As you can see, the total echinacea has come. The patient is unable to move, okay, in the globe. Now, just wanted to, for the sake of completion, I just wanted to show the retrobal bar block also. Before giving block, it is important to identify the site of the eye which you are going to operate, palpate the globe. Okay. Then similarly, palpate the lateral wall and so the needle I'm using is actually a little bit longer needle here, 31 millimeter. I won't go up to the full length of the needle. I'm now passed up to the middle. Okay, now I'm angulating the needle. You can very well appreciate here. I'm angle and I'm piercing the intramuscular septa also. I'm, I'm able to feel the tactile perception. I'm piercing the intramuscular septa when sudden giveaway will be there. Okay, that means the needle tip has reached the retrobulbar space and then I am started injecting. You can see that if you are in the right plane, the upper eyelid will start to droop down. Then I keep injecting and then withdraw the needle. Keep injecting and then the withdraw the needle. Okay, this is one technique. Then slowly remove the needle along the plane of insertion. As you can see, the patient doesn't have any pain at all if you are performing the injection very carefully and slowly. An almost complete block has come except for the medial upper eye movement because of the superior oblique. And again, I'm performing the superior block. Maybe if you want, you can have a second look at this uh, medial peribulbar block. This is the cantal angle and the caruncle. I'm dropping the needle in the blind pit. Aspirate and the remaining local anesthetics can be injected. The injection should be very slow, okay? That is very important. Then make sure the eyelids are closed. Then give the intermittent digital massage. The patient is unable to open the eyelid and total echinacea has been obtained. Okay. Now moving on to the next type of block, subtenance block. This is also called as cannula block because here we are not using a needle. We are going to use a blunt tipped subtenance cannula. Hence, it is also called as cannula block. The subtenance block is nothing but the local anesthetics is administered into the subtenance space. What is subtenance space? It is nothing but a virtual space around the eyeball between the sclera and the tenons capsule. Okay, it is nothing but a facial sheath that surrounds the eyeball which separates it from the orbital fat. Here we can appreciate this. This is a virtual space. Okay, that lies between the eyeball and the rest of the layer here. What are the anatomical consideration you should know. Anteriorly, it merges with the conjunctiva just behind the limbus, that is at the corneoscleral junction. Posteriorly, what happens? It fuses with the meninges around the optic nerve and with the sclera around the exit of the optic nerve. So it goes from the limbus and then connects to the optic nerve and then goes posteriorly. Okay. So what are the techniques of sub giving subtenance block? First, you can instill a topical anesthesia with the proparacaine drops. Okay. Then, you put an eyelid speculum. The most preferred quadrant is the inferonasal quadrant. Okay, this is the inferonasal quadrant. This is the nasal part. So, inferonasal quadrant, just about three to four millimeter away from the limbus. Why is this inferonasal quadrant is preferred? Because it is the least vascular, and this site is not preferred by the ophthalmologist to pass any buckles in during the surgery. Okay. So that is the reason why they say that inferonasal quadrant is the best site to perform the subtenance block. As you can see, I am both the conjunctiva and the tenons layer are gripped with the non tooth to forceps. So below the tenons capsule only lies the subtenon space. Okay. Now using a Westcott scissor, a small button hole is made into the conjunctiva and tenons capsule. Once a small nick is made, you can appreciate a white layer of the sclera. Okay, now the subtenon space is then assessed. Now the scissors is then closed. Remember that is very important. Do not open the scissors. Why this closed scissor is passing? Because to create a thin channel, okay? With the closed Westcott scissors, you create a thin channel, then just pass the equator of the globe to the posterior subtenon space. Then you bring back the scissors out. Then scissor holding the conjunctiva with the forceps, 
Then now a posterior subtenance cannula. Here is a cannula tip alone is seen. 19 gauge, 25 millimeter long, blunt. Cannula is then mounted to a 5 ml syringe with the local anesthetics. Next, it is then inserted through the hole along the curvature of the sclera. Now, once cannula is advanced to this depth, 3 to 4 ml of local anesthetics is then injected. So, what is the advantages? Now, coming to this, so we are making a naked the conjunctiva and tenons clear and with the help of scissors, making a track, then passing a blunt cannula. What is the mechanism? They say one is direct action on the short ciliary nose that traverse the subtenon space. Next, Local anesthetic spreads along the muscle sheets, diffuses into the intraconal compartment. From here, they say it spreads along the muscle sheets and diffuses into the intraconal compartment. Then if you inject more amount of local anesthetics, these local anesthetics can spread forwards into the facial pain and facial planes around the eyelid also. And eyelid block also can come with the subtenance block. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Advantages, it is lesser pain. As I was mentioning here, only a blunt tipped cannula is passed. It is not a blind procedure when compared to a needle block. I can say it is a semi-blind procedure. So lesser complications can occur when compared to the needle block. And that is the reason why of late, many of the ophthalmologists are elsewhere. If you see, the people are moving from needle block to this cannula block. Okay, And moreover, lesser volume is local anesthetics is required. Unlike needle blocks here, just 3 to 5 ml is required. And we can appreciate that there won't be any rise in intraocular pressure and nice eyelid echinacea can be obtained with subtenance block. But remember, there are some disadvantages. One, it is not suited for repeat surgeries. This is because of the vitrectomies and scarring of the conjunctiva will be there. So it is a relative contraindication. But remember, total echinacea sometimes may not be achieved. Variable degree of echinacea will be there and it requires some amount of surgical skills to complete the surgery uneventfully. Now coming to the last part, that is a topical anesthesia. It can be attained either with the drops or gel where we obtain the surface anesthesia of the cornea. But sometimes what happens during the topical anesthesia, they can, man the surgeons might manipulate the iris, okay? So which is now in turn, it can be some uh, intracameral anesthesia can be supplemented by giving intracameral lidocaine. So topical anesthesia supplemented with intracameral lidocaine will complete, will help to the surgery to be completed uneventfully. But there are some advantages and disadvantages also here. What are the advantages? There is no fear of pain of needle injection and there won't be any complications related to needle and cannula block. But remember, there are some disadvantages. It requires more surgical skills for the surgeons to operate because uh, it is a non echinetic technique. The eyeballs will be moving. So it requires more surgical skills and more degree of cooperativeness from patient is also required. Okay, that is very, very important. And most important thing, proper preoperative counseling is essential. You should explain to the patient that, that, there, that there may be a touch sensation and little bit of microscopic light and visual sensations can be retained. You should in counsel the patient. Otherwise, the patients get alarmed and panic attacks can be created. Okay. Then topical anesthesia, again, it is not suited for vitro retinal or prolonged duration of surgeries. Okay. With regard to the visual sensations of retain, I just wanted to mention here topical anesthesia, retained visual sensations is there. Now, these retained visual sensations can be reduced by giving IV midazolam. This is an interesting study which we did long back and it is published in Acta Ophthalmologica. You can go through. It is available online free where we gave one set of groups, IV midazolam, and the other group we just give a placebo that is normal saline. And we found that patients giving, receiving that IV midazolam, their satisfaction score, scale score was highly increased. Okay. Now, again, finally, I just wanted to complete this portion also. Facial nerve blocks. Facial nerve blocks are of four types. Mainly, it depends upon the site at which where we are blocking. One is O'Brien's technique. That is, here the injection is given just anterior to the ear. Anterior to the tragus of the ear, just above the mandibular condyloid process. Next, modified O'Brien's. That is called as nut bath. Here, injection is made just inferior to the earlobe. Here, you can see in this picture. So, O'Brien is more proximal trunk branch, 
blocked here. Nut bath is midway. Okay, injection is just inferior to the ear lobe. So Atkinson is still midway. You can see here. This is the C. C is the Atkinson where the injection is made along the inferior edge of the zygomatic bone, and then the needle is passed upwards across the zygomatic arch towards the top of the ear. Van lint is almost equivalent to that of the eyelid block. I can say van lint here. Okay. Infiltration just above the eyebrow and below the inferior margin. So there are four kinds, mainly to brief you, it is obrions, more proximally, we are blocking the facial nerve. Nut bath is midway and still coming to the midway is Atkinson and peripheral branches are mainly blocked through Van Lin technique. So almost in the half an hour, I have completed regional anesthesia, more than half an hour, I think so. Now moving on to general anesthesia, there are some indications, okay? The main indications, absolute will be naturally patient's refusal for regional blocks. Mentally retarded patients, definitely we should take it, take it up under general anesthesia, uncooperative patient, reaction or allergy to local anesthetics. That is, I can say relative, not an absolute one. Localized sepsis is absolute, then patient unable to lie down flat due to tremors like Parkinson's disease, then disturbing tremors, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Relative contraindications may be difficulty in communication, language barrier. Okay. Then <clears throat> prolonged the procedure, claustrophobic history, those kind of things, you can take up the patients for general anesthesia. With regard to general anesthesia, induction, it has to be always smooth, okay? Because IOP rise should not be there. So profol is considered as a better induction agent. The reason it has an antiemetic property, early recovery, and they say it has a greater reduction in the intraocular pressure when compared to type and tone. Management of airway, most important thing you should remember that airway is going to be inaccessible once the surgery is going to be started because the entire face of the patient's face is going to be covered with the surgical drapes and you will not be able to access the airway easily. So most important thing before surgery is start, airway must be firmly secured. That is very important. It can be either managed with laryngeal mask airway. If it is shorter during the procedure, if it is prolonged, you can intubate the patients with the endotracheal tube. It all depends upon the individual preference choice. Now, with regard to maintenance of anesthesia, it can be a volatile agent, sevo or isofluorine. Sevofluorine, they say that is a better because IOP is maintained throughout well with sevofluorine. <coughs> Sorry. For laryngeal mask airway, sometimes muscle relaxants is not required. TIVA can be done with profol, supplementing with uh, analgesics like injection fentanyl. But maintenance, remember the most important thing is that you should avoid bucking intraoperatively. So you should maintain the correct plane of anesthesia. Now coming to what are the various factors, okay, that which affects the intraocular pressure. It can be systemic factors or it can be a local factors also. Systemic factors, briefly I will uh, cover, that is, Whenever there is a large rise in the blood pressure, intraocular pressure can increase. Then, Valsalva maneuver. In the next slide, I will be covering what is the mechanism involved in it. Okay. Then, whenever there is hypoxia, hypercapnia, these are all some of the systemic factors at which rises the intraocular pressure. From anesthetic point of view, remember sympathetic stimulation, mainly due to the laryngoscopy and intubation. So, these are all some of the systemic factors which can increase the intraocular pressure much. Coming to the local factors, increased episcleral venous pressure. Now, next slide, I will be explaining the mechanism involved in it. This episcleral venous pressure can be increased by coughing, straining, crying, anxiety, etc., etc. There can be a blockage of trabecular meshwork. Remember, whenever uh, there is a uh, face mask that you're using during before that induction, it should be appropriately fitting, okay? If there is an inappropriate fitting or misfit face mask, then again, you might apply undue pressure and there can be a blockage of trabecular meshwork. Okay? That is very important. Then acute external pressure, as was mentioned, say, for example, if you are putting a tight tape here across the endotracheal tube, fixing it too tight, then again, it is a local factor that can raise the intraocular pressure, forced blinking, that eyelid blinking. Okay, If the eyelids are not blocked properly, then if the patient is constantly winking, then there is chances for rise in intraocular pressure. Now, what are the various systemic factors that can decrease the intraocular pressure? Large decrease in blood pressure, 
hypocapnia, hypothermia, acidosis, and coming to the local factor, decreased episcleral venous pressure, ocular trauma, and retinal detachment. These are all the local factors which can decrease the intraocular pressure. Now, coming to the mechanism, why is that cough, straining, or Valsalva maneuver, why it has to raise the intraocular pressure? As you can appreciate in this picture, in the anterior chamber, that is aqueous venous pressure is somewhere around 15 millimeters of mercury. Okay, whereas the episcleral venous pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it is this pressure gradient that 15 to 10, which enables the complete blood drainage occurring. So, if suppose the episcleral venous pressure increases, Whenever there is a central venous return obstruction, it can be due to cough, straining, bucking, etc., etc. Then what happens? This pressure gradient falls and the choroidal blood volume increases and this in turn results in the IOP. That is a basic mechanism why in ophthalmic anesthesia, always people wants to have a smooth induction and smooth extubation. Yes. Extubation must be smooth, avoid cough, straining, and post-operative nausea and vomiting to be avoided. And this can be given by giving, achieved by giving injection lidocaine, 1 milligram per kg body weight IV. Now, you should also remember what are the effects of different various anesthetic agents used on intraocular pressure. I have now tabulated in such a way, I covered first the induction agents, benzodiazepine, IV midazolam. Usually, they have no effect. Then thiopentone and profol. Profol decreases much actually the intraocular pressure. Here, this is the most important thing. Ketamine, that is a transient rise or some of them off late, they say there is no change at all, okay? Then pavilon, off late, we are not using it nowadays. Then vecronium, rocronium, atracurium, there is, they say there is no change or decrease. Inhalation agents decrease, neostigmine reversal agents does not have any effect on the intraocular pressure. Important point to be remembered is Ketamine. Now, moving on to the anesthesia for various ophthalmological subspecialities, the most commonest thing which we are all, uh, you people are expecting is anesthesia for squint surgery, also called as trabismus surgery, which is nothing but the misalignment of the eyes. Okay. Now, it typically presents between the age group of one to four years of age. Usually, this trabismus misalignment results by three months of age, they say. Now, those persisting beyond three months of age are considered to be abnormal. Sorry for this typo error, abnormal. In such cases, you should remember what are the briefly the causes for this. It can be congenital or it can be acquired also. So these are all some of the neurological and myopathy factors which can result in strabismus. So in pre-op evaluation, you should always keep in mind regarding this myasthenia gravis, any cerebrovascular accident, gullion barry syndrome, our patients can be having multiple sclerosis, myopathy, orbital disease, thyroid disorders, etc., etc. So these things you should keep in mind while we are evaluating the patients before surgery. And here you can see something cerebral palsy that can also result in a squint and there can be history of developmental delay and many syndromes can be associated with in the next slide I will be showing here. So these are the common syndromes which we do encounter when a patient is uh, coming for his corrective squint surgery. So the most challenging part of the anesthetics here is that the craniofacial abnormalities. So often they land up in difficult in airway and associated cardiac and muscle myopathies can be there. So these are all some of the syndromes. The most commonest which we encounter is Down syndrome. And this one, Golden Heart syndrome, Marfan's, Turner's, Eppert syndrome, and credo chart syndrome, this which we often cruise on. These are all some of the commonest syndrome which we often encounter. And these things you should keep in mind, okay, while doing a preoperative evaluation. So intraoperatively, one of the very known uh, complications that can be uh, expected is the ocular cardiac reflex, also called as Ashness phenomena or the trigemino cardiac reflex. Um, most of the postgraduates would be aware of this thing, I think so. The afferent will be the trigeminal branch, the afferent will be the vagus nerve here, okay? Reticular formation from here, the vagus nerve, then in turn it produces the various cardiac effects. So what are the predisposing factors for OCR? First and foremost is the traction on the extraocular muscles, okay? 
if there is too much of handling of the extracellular muscles then patients may go in for ocr then whenever the patient is in lighter plane also they say that younger age group because of possibly high vagal tone then hypercarbia hypoxemia acidosis hypoventilation so these are all some of the predisposing factors by which the patients have high chances of getting the ocr now what are the cardiac effects that can happen bradycardia ventricular bigemini sometimes ectopics junctional rhythm cardiac arrest then this is one common entity which i wanted to share with you remember there is an entity called as vagal escape it is nothing but the tendency for the patient to adapt to the vagal tone ocr normally what happens but gets fatigue with repetitive stimuli so that is the reason why if you see the first time the fraction is pushed more amount of bradycardia can happen whereas the second and third time what is happen that vagal now get adapted and there is some entity called as vagal escape now other <clears throat> so clinical association you should all remember is now there is a significant association between patients who had positive intraoperative ocr they say with the post operative nausea and vomiting okay because they follow the same reflex arc so children with positive ocr were found to have 2.6 times more likely to vomit than those without the ocr so in these patients you should give adequate antiemetics now how to prevent constant monitoring yes definitely it is required gentle handling of the tissues so the moment you should you see the bradycardia in the monitor you should advise the surgeons to release the traction on the extraocular muscles okay so gentle handling or no handling of the extraocular muscles if there is sudden uh, severe bradycardia then provide adequate anticholinergic pr uh, protection in the form of pre medication maintaining adequate depth of anesthesia because lighter plane can be a predisposing factor for ocr coming to the treatment regional blocks mechanism it blocks the afferent limb of the reflex whereas while giving the iv atropine it blocks the efferent limb of the reflex now one more uh, entity i just wanted to um, mention it here that is called forced reduction test i don't know how many of you are aware of this entity this is a commonest test that is performed by the squint surgeon before uh, performing the surgery what they do is that with the help of forceps just at the limbus they move the globe in all the directions okay it is either if the patient is cooperative they do it awake or they do soon after induction but remember before the start of surgery to detect any restriction in eye movements what is that they do they feel if there is any resistance is felt then they say it is a positive force duction test whereas if the if it is freely moving they say it is a negative force duction test what is the anesthetic implications or consideration you should remember is that succinylmethonium remember it can cause a um, tonic conic contractions of the extraocular muscles and it can interfere with this because based on the positive negative results the surgeon decides the um, steps of the surgery okay but remember the non depolarizing muscle relaxant does not interfere with the force duction test either you should avoid succinyl methionine or you should wait for 20 minutes then you can ask the surgeon to um, carry on with this force duction test next moving on to the next surgery glaucoma surgery once again there are a lot of syndromes congenital syndromes and again these are all associated with lot of craniofacial abnormalities and cns manifestations with regard to that um, anesthetic agents except ketamine and succinylmethionine most of the anesthetic agents they reduce the intraocular pressure but remember some adult patients might require urgent reduction of intraocular pressure okay so iv mannitol 20% might be required by the ophthalmologist regional anesthesia as i was mentioning before the needle blocks can raise the intraocular pressure hence for these type of surgery either they can do it at a subtenance block or topical anesthesia vitreoretinal surgeries it is most uh, commonly performed for mainly for two reason one for the reattachment of detached to retina and for the removal of vitreous opacities now this reattachment of the different layers of the retina can be obtained either by the external tamponade okay external tamponade is given by passing a silicon rubber band near the break internal tamponade is given 
by injecting saline or gas or air or silicon oil through the vitrectomy hence we are trying to oppose the detached retinal layers and hence we try to reattach the layers either by external tamponade or internal tamponade now the, the with regard to general anesthesia the point to be considered is the air gas mixture when surgeons is using that is perfluoropropane or sulfur hexafluoride is used remember nitrous oxide will diffuse into this air cavity much faster than nitrogen would diffuse out hence nitrous oxide has to be discontinued around 10 to 15 minutes before this gases are injected gases on also you should remember these gases may persist in the eye for up to 10 days to 6 weeks following surgery elsewhere if you see these type of patients who are um, injected with these gases they have a bracelets okay which will mention the type of gases that has been injected so if they are landing up in some emergency surgeries it is very important that anesthetist should avoid the nitrous oxide so this is one point to be you should all remember these gases may persist and nitrous oxide to be avoided for subsequent surgeries for 10 days to 6 weeks following this type of surgery now coming to the corneal surgeries the most commonly performed is penetrating keratoplasty where a full thickness corneal graft is removed and it is replaced with a healthy donor cornea again sorry for the typo error it is cornea now the full thickness um, diseased cornea is removed okay so what will happen the eye will be opened that is called as open sky situation this is going to be a real real nightmare time for the surgeons because during this time there should not be any straining of the patient moving of the patient bucking so during this time you should try to maintain not try you should maintain the depth of the anesthesia adequately okay and if it is local anesthesia the patient should not cough or move so otherwise what will happen all the intraocular contents can expel and supracoroidal hemorrhage can happen <clears throat> now coming to the next uh, oculoplasty surgical uh, procedures that is most commonly uh, followed is syringing and probing of the nasolacrimal duct which is mainly done to remove the nasolacrimal obstruction in children with increased tearing okay so although it is a minimal procedure remember it is very important that we are intubating the patient and the nasopharynx the oropharynx is nicely nicely packed with gauze because many times what will happen they will do not only the probing but also syringing so small amount of saline will be pushed through this nasolacrimal duct and there are chances for aspirations and it is always better okay it is a good practice to have intubated the patient and throat packed with gauze there are some case rep um, reports where that uh, they are doing this syringing and probing with the lma but provided they put a suction suction through the nostrils so that whatever the fluid they are injecting constantly it get sucked also so my advice will be endotracheal tube intubation better and with the throat has to be packed with the gauze though it is a very small procedure then dacrocystorhinostomy dcr it is a surgical exposure of the duct and a new opening is created between the sac and the nasal cavity remember it can be done in two ways endoscopically that is through the nasal where general anesthesia is preferred by the surgeons whereas if it is done externally regional anesthesia with sedation like dexmedetomidine or fentanyl propofol etc can be given but the most important thing that surgeons expects is hypotensive anesthesia if it is general anesthesia it can be given with volatile anesthesia volatile agents can provide this necessary hypotension so i think i have almost one at the end of one hour i almost completed most of the regional anesthesia and general anesthesia for uh, um, those anesthetists who are interested you, this book is available at amazon it is principles and practice of ophthalmic anesthesia it is nearly 30 chapters in it 30 chapters so the first 15 chapters will be covering regional ophthalmic anesthesia and the next 15 chapters will be covered will be covering general anesthesia so it includes both national and international faculty so those people who are interested can please purchase this book and um, this is the latest update in regional anesthesia we have developed a needle block simulator and subtenon block simulator first of its kind along with the indian institute of iit m chennai here in the needle block the camera is placed behind the globe and we can real time visualization you can see where the needle is going okay so that helps in training 
and the septinons block again we have maintained we have now used the silicon layer for the conjunctiva and tenons and they can even perform the septinons block and this interface where you can see whether you are on the right plane it can be demonstrated here and uh, just to complete there is an association called as association of indian ophthalmic anesthesiologists whosoever is interested can visit and we have a journal also every biannually we release it called as indian journal of ophthalmic anesthesia the membership life membership is also there we can go this www.aoa.org.in thank you all wish you a very happy new year 2023 thank you so much sir for such a comprehensive and exhaustive lecture you've taken i think all the students must have been uh, benefited by this so i have a small query would you like to put an lma in such a case for yes. syringing and probing or you will yeah, prefer is, putting an yeah. endotracheal tube <clears throat> endotracheal tube but that is what i was mentioning if we are going to put laryngeal mask airway and if they are going to do a syring uh, syringing also some of the um, anesthetists what they do is they put a constant suction through the nostrils okay so that will keep sucking that fluids Although they inject one to two ml, sometimes they say that point five ml only. I'm injecting, sir. So that doesn't matter. Okay, so it depends. Sometimes you will never know how much ml they are injecting. But my best advice for a safe and ophthalmic anesthesia practice will be endotracheal tube intubation, though it is a small procedure. Right, sir. So there's a question by Mr. Like uh, Doctor Parul. Yes, sir. I'd like to Sorry, just sir. add in here, Doctor Chandran. Uh, thank you very much for that and excellent talk covering almost all the aspects of ophthalmic anesthesia. And I'm I know it was a difficult task to cover so much so many topics in one hour, but there have been now numerous studies uh, which have been done uh, wherein they have put supraglottic airway devices, especially the second generation ones, and intentionally they put dye yeah methylene blue dye methyl over the second generation supraglottic airway devices they did a fiber optic before putting in dye and after putting in dye and it was confirmed by the anesthesiologists that there is no leak of uh, any uh, dye into the airway Sub lower airway so if the second generation supraglottic airway devices like i gel they are all properly placed uh, then definitely now it the evidence is there that we should be now not worrying about the so called theoretical risk of aspiration aspiration yes definitely there is a controversy of using a pure airway mask with suction in yeah, yeah. and uh, having a supraglottic airway devices and yes it at times it takes only 0.5 ml but it can it take it can take 2 to 3 ml also more also and there are some debris also which will be there uh, obstructing the nasolacrimal duct but second generation supraglottic devices now have got a strong evidence to the extent that they have been used as an rescue airway device for cesarean sections also where you are not able to intubate but to maintaining the uh, ventilation they are able and that has also been shown that pregnancies are considered as full stomach only with beyond doubt that properly positioned second generation supraglottic airway devices will prevent aspiration to the maximum possible extent over to you parul thank you so much sir so there is a query by dr sushil he wants to know what is the drug and volume for giving medial canthus and perivalvar block yeah as i was mentioning the drugs nothing specific all the local anesthetics can be given the volume is 3 to 8 10 ml that is also not a fixed one and off late if you see elsewhere they are following only single medial pericanthal block okay they say that double is a trouble so they doesn't want to give the inferior lateral and then medial block so some of the um, ophthalmologists uh, and the anesthetists practicing especially else in uk they are following the single medial block so that the advantage is more is the number of pricks more is the complications they say so just give a single medial peribulbar nice 3 to 8 ml that is sufficient but uh, still it that practice has to come in india especially in teaching institute where there is a lot of manipulation occurring i think double technique is still been followed here thank you so much sir 
uh, we don't have any more queries, but we have some uh, really good compliments for you, sir, that it was a very comprehensive and an excellent lecture. I uh, may request the audience to unmute themselves, and if they have a query, they can raise their hands, and we'll go through the queries. No, all can unmute themselves. Uh, Naveen sir, I don't think anybody uh, has any. There are all compliments on compliments coming. Oh, they're just compliments for the such a nice and a comprehensive lecture, sir. But uh, just uh, can Dr. Navin, may I complete with one more controversial this thing? I will complete it. That is open globe injury. That is yeah. most commonly encountered uh, questions by the postgraduates. Open globe injury. What is that? Uh, they, half late, if you see the success, <laughs> it is just a myth that raises the intraocular pressure. There are not even a single case reports which clearly states that saxamethonium per se can result in expulsion of intraocular contents. So what they say is, if you see the algorithm, if the eye is viable, you patch the eye, you proceed with the saxamethonium or with the rapid in, uh, intubating agents like rocuronium. If eye is non-viable and if you uh, anticipate any difficulty in airway, you can go for fiber optic laryngoscope because associated coughing and straining can be there. So this is the point which I want to mention it here. You are right, absolutely right that perforating eye injuries or open globe injuries where we were worried about intraocular uh, pressure rise. If patient, these patients are also at times full stomach and yes, succinylcholine has been used to prevent aspiration while mitigating all the steps of avoiding uh, increasing IOP. Yeah, exactly. but, the, but with the easy availability of rocronium yeah. and its efficacy of uh, when we use in the dose of 1.2 milligrams per kg, uh, and we can in, uh, achieve the intubating conditions in 45 to 60 seconds. And now with the availability of Sugamadex also, so we are not worried about using yeah. rocronium exactly. and reversibility also. But yes, definitely uh, for perforating eye injuries, uh, these uh, things have to be taken in mind. Now, uh, I, I, I may have missed it, but just for the chronic pain aspect of, uh, see these patients of Catrick, they are often referred to pain clinics for two, sub, two sub, su, subsets. One is infraorbital uh, neuralgias. Yeah. Uh, patients who have undergone cataract surgery, they often come, come to us with infraorbital uh, neuralgias. And secondly, those patients who have almost their uh, eye removed in whichever yeah, I take or loss uh, and uh, there is either enucleation or exenteration and they come with continuous pain in the empty orbit. So yeah. how to go about these two, yeah. those two subset of patients? Um, I do have a publication on it. It is published in Oman Journal of Ophthalmology. I can say that is a first of its kind where uh, I performed a retrobulbar alcohol injection, ethyl alcohol, 99.99% at which I injected retrobulbar. I think uh, to my knowledge in the literature, if you see that was the first injection given in an enucleated eye. So far, they were giving for chronic blind eye, okay, where there is a neovascular glaucoma patient landing up with a chronic pain and those kind of things. So once we had, we do encountered a patient with a bilateral enucleated eye, but only complaint he had was a severe pain. So then we tried a retrobulbar uh, neurolytic alcohol injection. So first thing you should do is you should inject uh, we should place the 3 to 5 ml of local anesthetics, okay? 2 to 3 ml of local anesthetics has to be injected. Remove the uh, syringe to hold this needle. Why I am injecting local anesthetics is that to confirm that the needle is in the target area. The pain has to be reduced. Then I fix the syringe with the, uh, into that. Um, then I fix the cannula loaded with the alcohol with the same, with, without disturbing the needle. I then inject 3 to one to two cc of retrobulb bar alcohol. Sometimes it takes 24 to 48 hours for the pain to subside. And they say the recurrence of pain can be somewhere around three to six weeks. So retrobulb bar alcohol is a one neurolytic agent that is a choice for this, uh, especially with the enucleated eye. Definitely, these are these are these are the important subsets of the patients, and which we have to cater to as an anesthesiologist. And infraorbital neuralgia, 
uh, I personally, what I feel is that it can be managed by uh, uh, carbamazepine and uh, combining it with uh, gabapentin or pregabalin. Dr. Ganyotri, sir, wants to make a point. Yeah. Sir, you, your audio is not there, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, my only query is that you have given the alcohol, but it affects the opposite eye also regarding no. the uh, optic neuritis. This is my observation. Long back, I was used to giving this thing. But okay. what about your opinion about the phenol, 4% phenol? Okay. That is more effective than the alcohol regarding this sort of pain. Uh, yeah, I'll agree to sir in the extent that yes, uh, vis a vis neuralgic agents use, using of, uh, though we call it 99.9, .9, it is absolute, maybe it gets absorbed and it's 95% or maybe less. It is but, hypo, it is hypo, that's why it is spread faster than the phenol uh, and it affects the other opposite side also. 4 to 6 percent of phenol, uh, 2 to 3 ml. Uh, and less, and less incidence of differentiation syndromes also. Yes. Over yeah, actually they have tried some different phenols as you was mentioning. There are a review of literatures, review of review articles also. What are the different anesthetics agents used? There? Sorry, neurolytic agents used phenol and those kind of things. One thing which they found with phenol is the other day, a complete swelling of the upper uh, total hyal was seen, which they are not able to... Subdermal, subdermal uh, edema was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah yes, yeah. subdermal edema. And, and it uh, disappears within the six to seven yeah, days. It will, it will disappear, sir. It will disappear, resolve on its own. A nice tight patch should be given. But mm. most of the authors are using no, this. But, but it may lead to the keratitis. Mm. But Mind well. Mm. That is the problem with this. Alcohol yeah, this injection. Some of the complications reported, yeah. Nay, with the neuritis, this is the complication of keratitis also. I have seen a case of exposure keratitis due to this phenomenon. Yeah. And okay. my second question is that in the congenital cataract, what is mm. the lowest age you have dealt with? Congenital cataract when maybe around uh, six months to one year also. We have... I have given 28 no, days, no, boy. Yeah, we used to give, sir, actually. The congenital cataract 28 days, easy. boy, bilateral yeah, cataract uh, aspiration. Ketamine, also, only yeah. ketamine, that's all. Neonate also you should do, no? So early they, you do the surgical correction, the visual axis get correct. Yes. No? Yes. So we do come across a lot of uh, early surgery. Correct. Very nice lecture, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Get the patients uh, we often encounter with uh, movement disorders uh, where, where they cannot lie still, coming for simple cataract surgery. So how to deal with such patients? Two types of patients. Patient. One, patient. patient. one, one who are uh, on some movement disorders who cannot lie still, and secondly, patients with ankylosing spondylitis who cannot lie down still. So the most they develop with the vascular syndrome. Mm. So the most important thing is during that preoperative evaluation, you make the patient lie down. You should try to identify before how much they are comfortable. Some of the patients we have we have encountered some eight to nine pillows also required. So what will happen is that the head end will be totally elevated and in fact the surgeons will be forced to stand and operate those procedures okay so those are all some of the challenges which we encounter local so, adaptation yeah and very rarely some not very rarely i would say often with sedation uh, that tremors if there is minus they do settle with that sedation so we can mostly in parkinsonism it is a problem to fix the head Sometimes they go on movements, so it is very difficult to control that. Then no other way, general anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Jayachandran, we have seen in such patients after care for evaluation, uh, sedation with propofol, mm -hmm. uh, it took day in and day out procedure, it, 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 is, it is quite helpful. Yeah. And yes, I agree with you for angst spawn and other spinal deformities, we have to pre-op plan with so many pillows and ensure the surgeon is tall enough or he or she also, she, <laughs> especially she stands on a, a big height and operates not sitting because they are used to operate in sitting position than standing position. Yes. One final sub uh, from my side, then it, I, I open it up. What is your take home message for postgraduates for oculocardic reflex? <laughs> Constant monitoring, sir. That is very, very important. Constant monitoring. And uh, I used to give the lecture to the ophthalmologist. That is, 
your eyes should be not only be focused your ears should also be tuned to that monitor sound because sometimes what happens is switch off the monitor so the ears also should be tuned so monitoring vigilant monitoring and maybe proper pre medication is also can prevent this ocr happen yeah. right arun you can take comments or remarks from questions from other audience also uh, i would request all yes, the sir. audience to unmute yourself and if you have any query or you want to make a comment you can just uh, make that comment please yes sir i am pk agrawal uh, many times uh, surgeon encountered systemic toxicity in form of cns and first is excitement they call me that patient is non cooperative please he come and give ga then i explained them that you have given large uh, amount of local and then they massage and sometime their assistant give block they give large amount of uh, like field block then after my uh, repeated guidance incidence decreased they thought that patient is uncooperative the patient cries and stand up and runs away is it right it is systemic toxicity yeah, initially in form of excitement so the most important thing is um, proper administration of the block the techniques has to be properly administered sometimes what is happening if the techniques is not properly taught to the patient how Now to administer is... the block there are chances of intravascular one and as i was mentioning in my lecture the eye should be in primary gaze position then what will happen complete mm -hmm. brain stem anesthesia can happen and the ophthalmologist mm -hmm. should be made aware of the dose of the local anesthetic this is what i focused on my lecture for the ophthalmologist regarding the dose regarding the how to administer properly and those awareness has to be created among the ophthalmologist now incidence has decreased now yeah definitely definitely mm -hmm. more most are mm -hmm. doing in peribulbar and topical i was uh, telling about few years back okay many years back uh, but sir your point is absolutely well taken we all have seen in our institutes or in our clinical practice lots of lots of systemic side effects and toxicity occurring either because of inadvertent uh, injection into the intravascular compartment or a wrong block being given or by having giving a uh, inappropriate dose but all said and done majority of the institutes now or the good hospitals are getting it done under monitor anesthesia care so Indeed. with 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 monitor anesthesia care definitely uh, pre operative evaluation as well as continuous intraoperative monitoring uh, is there so there's a question by dr anand he wants to know that what is uh, what happens if there is an intraoperative hypertension how will you manage it uh, what kind of sedation and anything specific you uh, like to do at the stage If it is local anesthesia, I may try a bolus dose, bolus dose of propofol, or if the oculoplasty procedure, I would have carried with dexmedetomide. Okay, so these are general well, anesthesia means. One more thing I want to ask. Yes, sir. Um, in pediatrics, sir, uh, um, a traumatic cataract or an atrial cataract, I used to give. um like to select slightly like iv agent propofen of thermologist gives a block and then it is smoothly conducted and for many years we are doing this is it uh, okay no, i didn't get you sir your so your internet not... is uh, not uh, stable can you just repeat your question again sir if you don't mind uh, sir instead of intubating for um, um uh cataract surgery in children that is traumatic cataract or uh, congenital cataract that is nowadays of uh, 10 minutes procedure i used to give um, ga then surgeon gives local peribulbar or uh, whatever is and then it is done intermittent okay. iv supplementation though there is risk of uh, per operative a uh, problem but it is being done successfully for many years so the one thing which i want to mera matlab hai sir ki yeah. ga i do understand uh, yeah, yeah. i do understand your question 
So the one thing which, especially for the postgraduates, I just wanted to mention that ophthalmic anesthesia airway is going to be inaccessible, as I was mentioning. So the gold standard will be maintaining the airway, especially if the airway is not in your hands, the rooms are suddenly going to be darkened. We will never know when the desaturation is going to happen. Uh, this, yeah. These are the some of the uh, problem can occur. Yeah, very, very But important. where facilities are not available, we uh, taking risk, we doing this. Till now, no problem occurs. Occurred. <laughs> okay. uh, so we have a query by Dr. Bhav Bhavya Krishna. Dr. Bhavya, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, ma'am. I've just unmuted myself. I'm sorry, my camera is not working. Um, not a so problem. I don't have an academic question. I actually have a clinical question uh, just based out of uh, practice. I'm just curious to know. So we get a lot of syringing and probing cases in our institute. And there's where, there's a very varied uh, practice. Somebody puts supraglottic airway, somebody intubates because it's a, it's a short procedure. I just like I'm curious, uh, you know, what is practiced in other institutes? Personally, I prefer I um, tubing no, the patient. Just, I, I think but, your answer was very clearly. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Navin, you want to comment? <laughs> anyway, Bhavya, uh, this, I think you joined slightly late. We I joined slightly late, late, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll discuss this thing. And uh, uh, there are two, since it is, a, to be honest, a five minutes procedure. Yes. And uh, I'll just add on to which we discussed earlier, the mask holding. <laughs> You, you gradually get tuned up to hold the mask in reverse position. You're not standing at the end mm -hmm. up, but now mm -hmm. you're standing near the chin. And mm -hmm. yes, you should your mask holding and uh, putting the, opening the airways should be perfect. But to be on a safer side, to be on a safer side, there are two theories which are being done. One is putting second generation supraglottic airway devices. Mm -hmm. The second one is going for endotracheal intubation. Few will do it in a mask with a suction catheter in, which is practically not very safe. Mm -hmm. But yes, I can see you. Uh, second generation supraglottic airway devices, even if you, they, uh, I was just quoting that study, wherein 5 ml of methylene blue dye was put and there was not even a drop leak into the, uh, which was the patients were evaluated with fiber optic bronchoscopy before or after putting. So second generation supraglottic airway devices are absolutely safe as far as syringing and probing is there. And they can be, you can put them in the uh, spontaneous respiration, either with sevoflurane or if you prefer uh, propofol, that's up to you if the child is not that small. But uh, we in our clinical practice definitely go for a spontaneously breathing patient uh, under sevoflurane uh, with a supraglottic second generation device like uh, eye gel or so. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Bhavya. Thank you. Uh, sir, we don't have any more queries. Can we close the uh, session with your permission? Here, uh, to the close of uh, this today's class also. So uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Venkat Giri and Dr. Bajwa, both are stuck up uh, with clinical cases. I convey thanks to Dr. Jayachandran. I understand that, yes, this class was, uh, our roster of December has been fixed in uh, October and September. So thank you, Dr. Jayachandran, uh, for uh, mm -hmm sharing your uh, clinical experience and expertise and knowledge with us regarding ophthalmic anesthesia and all covering almost all the aspects pertaining to the anesthesia for ophthalmic surgery. Uh, Dr. Jatmarin is a dear friend and I hope to see you uh, in near future talking about more about ophthalmic anesthesia or any other topic of your interest. Thank you, Dr. Jayachandran. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my thank you, Dr. So you. see you all you, next thank week. You. Same time, 5 p.m. And I thank Dr. Paro also for nicely so coming to today's class. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank Good you, night. Sir.